now what we have is on the other side of the whole you know world on the fertility industry that it's only up to what the adults want even if it flies into the face of biology itself it is a remarkably contradictory experience now the first question we have today has to do with the definition of the family as it pertains to adoption and we've we've sort of um, dealt a little bit with this issue it, earlier this year I think we did a couple of commentaries um, touching on it but there are questions about uh, you know what constitutes a family in light of the needs of children especially children who are uh, up for adoption who are who need a home um, and so let's let me read this question and then we can talk about all the different um, you know facets we need to approach this from this person writes our family was together recently sharing dinner at one point the conversation went to the adoption agency that changed their position and are now placing children in the homes of same-sex couples. I expressed how shocked and disappointed I was. At this point, my son, who is 38, interjected that it's better for these children to be in a home where they're loved than to be in no home. My son is a grounded Christian thinker, single, so I was taken aback and stunned. Would you please give me your insight on, on this? I don't agree with him, but I'm not sure how to give him a biblical rebuttal. Yeah, we hear this question a lot. I'll give you three uh, quick angles on this. The first angle is that a, a homosexual couple, a same-sex couple, is not a home or a family in any sort of natural design. So to say that it's better for a child to be in that home uh, rather than um, a, uh, an orphanage or a care facility is uh, just a mistake. There's no evidence, first of all, that they'll do better in that context than in a loving caring group home or a facility or you know in foster care or or anything like that because neither one of those uh, things are a replacement of uh, the way that we now know both from scripture and from history and society itself uh, what makes a family? Um, you know, we uh, had a great conversation with Emily Gao of the Heritage Foundation, who authored that document that we've been talking about recently about Promise to America's Children. She'll be at Wilberforce here in a couple weeks. And she talks about this all the time, that there's really no such thing as parents. There's only mothers and fathers, scientifically, biologically, relationally, spiritually. You go down the list in every way of measuring the impact of a caring, loving adult on a child. Uh, there's mothers and fathers. There's not parents. There's distinct things that come into it. So in other words, there, there, there's an assumption in the question itself uh, that a same-sex couple is a legitimate replacement for a mom and a dad, and that just doesn't exist. The, the second thing in this question is that it assumes that the worst case scenario is always the scenario. And here's what I mean by that. Um, that the situation that the child, uh, either who has been orphaned or who has been abandoned or something like that is in, is you know this you know terrible terrible situation homeless under a bridge you know facing abusive situations or that sort of thing and therefore he needs a home and the answer to that is he does need a place to stay or she needs a place to stay that that's just a kind of triage that's not a long-term solution that we should build policy off of caring for the immediate health and well-being of these children should be first and foremost in our minds and something that gets them out of harm's way, you know, out of a, you know, a refugee situation in a UN camp or out of a homeless situation. All that's completely legitimate. But assuming that every case, particularly in the United States, is a worst case scenario is not what the evidence suggests. And it goes back to my first reason, which has to do with why would we think that a same sex couple that doesn't have any of the components of a natural family uh, would somehow be able to provide any more of a better replacement than a loving, caring facility, organizations that have spent years doing this. Um, and, and then the other assumption in the worst case scenario is that if these Christian adoption groups do not offer these services, then these services are not offered to these kids. That, that is flat out not the case. Now, look, Christians have proven themselves, Christian organizations have proven themselves way better at the foster care and adoption work than any other organization. But every city, every town, you can take the first place this story broke where the city of Boston tried to force Catholic charities 
you know, into doing this sort of work. Catholic Charities have been doing this for 100 years. Like, they're the old guys on the block. But you know what? There were dozens of other organizations that would adopt uh, children into same-sex homes, including the state-run organizations, not to mention other uh, nonprofits run by, um, you know, different groups. Why... The, the response from this guy's son assumes that if this Christian organization doesn't um, provide these services, these services will not be provided. I just want to say definitively, that's basically never the case in America on LGBTQ rights things. That if Christians don't accommodate, then these services won't be provided. Now, it's, of course, it's questionable whether the services that we're talking about are so-called rights or so-called you know, matters of public accommodation. That's a very, very important question in and of itself. But it's, it's just not the case. And in and, 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 and all the situations we know of so far, florists, photographers, adoption agencies, uh, there's plenty of other organizations that will do this work. Um, yeah. And uh, so for a Christian organization to change on this uh, is, is really important. And I had a third point, and it was going to be revolutionary and life-changing, but now I can't remember it. So I'll let you, I'll let you did, take a you stab at it. I'll see if I can come back there, to so it. We're, so we're good. And I also want to say I, I, don't, I don't remember um, there being any indication whether this was a mother or father in here. So it may not be a guy. It may be a uh, mother. But in, in any Oh, case, in terms of the, the question? Okay, right, yeah. Or yeah. The, the, the person who asked the question, yeah, fair enough. We don't want to I assume did. gender. That would be a wrong thing to do. It's card, well, it's cardinal sin these days. Um, you know, John, I'm struck by the way that we live in a time of just radical nominalism. And, and I'm just going to throw that philosophical 50 cent word out there. And it just means basically things have no essences. They don't have, uh, they don't have an essential quality. You can just name something what you want it to be. And it is that thing. And we, we, we act like you can, you know, sort of rename red blue and say, well, why can't, why can't red be blue? Well, because red's not blue. Um, why can't a same-sex couple be a family? Well, because they're not a, they're not a family. They're not a, a marriage. That's what that's what Ryan Anderson back in the uh, back in the the halcyon days of the debate preceding Obergefell um, kept emphasizing again and again and sort of getting raked over the coals for is that it's it's not about excluding someone from the right to marry. It's that uh, what same-sex couples want is not a marriage. It just isn't, and you can't indefinitely redefine the concept of marriage um, and family. It, it, without making it meaningless. And if anything, the, the idea that uh, it's two people in a committed relationship, well, the number two is less essential to the whole arrangement than uh, co the complementarity of the sexes is. So we've, we've entered this phase where we think we can just slap names on anything and then make demands based on the name we've slapped on it. And that doesn't make any, that doesn't make any philosophical or ultimately social sense. The premise here, or one of the many premises in the question, is that any family is better than no family. But first we have to figure out what the heck a family is. Otherwise we can just slap, a, slap that name on any arrangement of, uh, of adults shacking up together and say, and I don't mean to be crass here, but um, that's really the kind of attitude that we've, we've entered here, that we can just say whatever we want as a family and then um, kids need families and so why are you depriving these, uh, these families of kids or these kids of families? <laughs> Let's, let's define our terms first and figure out what it is we mean by family. Another premise that's really hidden in the question is that there's a shortage of adoptive families. Um, John, I did a little bit of, of searching around prior to this, and domestic, the best, as best I can tell, domestically in the U.S., it is just not the case that there's a shortage of adoptive families, that the ratio is you know, skewed toward kids who need a home versus uh, families. The, the problem is, and I know this from experience within my, my own extended family, um, that the process of getting a, 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 mm -hmm. you know, adopting a child is harrowing. It's unbelievable. It's and like, it should and, be. And it should be. Yeah, I mean, it should be difficult. Th this but, is a, I mean, maybe it shouldn't be as hard as it is, and I don't right. know how Florida is, well, but, you're, you know, but this is a big deal. And that's why your initial point of we can't just slap a label on it and say that it's equal is yeah. legitimate because it's such a big deal. Well, not just that, but that the, um, the change in many adoptive agencies to cater to LGBT, um, quote unquote, families, you know, these arrangements has actually gummed up the system and made it worse and more difficult for children to get into families. Um, I have a relative who she and her husband are, have been trying to adopt for, uh, for some time now. They've been turned down by multiple adoption agencies precisely because they, they gave the wrong answers 
on the when the LGBT question came up. So oh, in terms of uh, personal conviction, that you have to you have to have the right answers, or you're a danger, Mm -hmm. right? Or or transgender. Uh, Well, you know, hold on. That's a fascinating point because so I've never heard it put this way. Wouldn't it be better to have a a, a, a child placed in a homophobic home than not have a home at all. I mean, no <laughs> right. one's ever reversed it and asked that same thing, right? No, no, they never do. And the, you know, the assumption there just slides under the radar and um, gets baked into the question. Mm-hmm. And I think w- one of the wise parts about, you know, um, I guess Greg Kokel came up with the whole, you know, asking questions. What do you mean by that thing? But and, and you've you've uh, really emphasized that over the years, John. But one of the wisest things about that is it forces people to step outside the narrative to take off their sort of polemicist hat and and just begin to figure out what's really true. So often we get stuck in these scripts where we just make demands and, and throw political slogans at each other. And um, a lot of times, not only can the people using those slogans uh, obscure the real issue for themselves, but they'll put uh, Christians, often, you know, like this Christian parent, in the in the awkward position of sort of having to either deconstruct it or look like a real bad guy. And that's a, you know, it's an uncomfortable position to be in, but it's not one that you should have to, it's not a role you should have to play. You know, why are you depriving kids of families here? Well, it's a loaded question. We got to take it apart the way that we're doing here. And the most important thing is we've got to ask uh, the key question and and we've got to ask it the right way. Um, What are the needs and rights of the child? That's what Katie Faust emphasized when we talked about her book a couple of months ago. Um, we come at this so often from the perspective, implicitly, especially with the LGBT issue, of um, the rights and needs of adults. Like, we are, we're a family. We have come together, this same-sex couple. We have a right and a need for a child. This is part of the, um, our full participation in society. And it's never put that way, but that's the, that's the implication that lies beneath it. We need to ask what the child needs, and the child yeah. needs a mom and a dad. That's not to go. I mean, that's just that's just a fact. Well, you hit on something that reminded me of the kind of the third point, which is the idea of putting children's rights ahead of adult happiness is at the root of the issue culturally, not just on this specific one. Like, you know, someone should someone be able to adopt just because they want to No, there there is a reason we moderate and regulate this process and probably do it wrongly. But we should regulate it because you shouldn't just be able to go to the Walmart and pick out, you know, like you would go to Walmart and pick out a new refrigerator, you know, which is kind of. But, but it's, it's the attitude of treating uh, children as things that we have a right to other than independent, uh, 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 not helpless, but fragile lives that we should, you know, protect their rights and, and, and serve them. That's at the, at the root of all this, because. Th- think about the conflicting values that are here between the reproductive industry, um, by and large, in which uh, individuals can go and have children on their own terms, including increasingly, you know, embryo selection, uh, which we already do on disability. It's just a small step on other genetic traits. Uh, but couples that you know, we we did a, a, a breakpoint commentary just recently on. You know, w- women who, who, who have been sold that, you know, you can have children whenever you want, so go ahead and have your career and have it all. And then it comes around and it, it doesn't deliver because they've been told a wrong thing about the idea of procreation to begin with. So, so this scenario of all these same-sex couples lining up to adopt is just not legitimate. What's happening is same-sex couples are lining up and driving forward the fertility industry. Now, that's a fascinating and a troubling scenario in two ways. First is that here you have a, a, a individuals who have chosen a relationship that is by nature sterile. You know, it's not a disability that two men or two women cannot produce a child it's, through it's sex. It's not accidentally it, sterile. It's essentially sterile. No, it's essentially. It's by nature. It's ontologically, a, you know, a reality. And they can't. Um, and so now, even in legislation and, of course, access to fertility, uh, you know, through surrogates and other things, the idea is to demand the right to children. Now, now, you see how different that is than what has to happen in an adoptive situation. In an adoptive situation, you know, it, it's the child that's been traumatized, the, the child that is in need of help, and so the child's rights have to be put forward, which is why it has to be a regulated sort of thing. Now, what we have is on the other side of the whole, you know, world on the fertility industry, that it's only up to what 
the adults want, even if it flies into the face of biology itself. It is a remarkably contradictory experience. And we're also dealing with this reality of demand, not just, you know, are there people lining up to adopt? Yes. Are there enough? No. Are Christians by and far the, the most? Yes. Um, but, but at the same time, it, it's, it's a misnomer that there's this um, kind of reality on the ground with all of these children and the same-sex couples are going to, you know, fly in and save the day. What's actually happening is in that behavior itself, in that relationship itself, is a, uh, a reversal of priorities between personal desire and living in alignment with reality. So it, it just is built into the whole system. So it's built into the mindset, which is why what we're seeing is same-sex couples driving the fertility industry, especially fertility tourism. When you're talking about country, Western countries around the world uh, that have you know, uh, laws against commercial surrogacy because it's so exploitative of women, and at the same time having this push towards same-sex marriage, same-sex couples, uh, so now you have this growth of couples who now de de demand to have, uh, you know, a child, having chosen a relationship that is childless by nature, where nothing's broken, nothing's wrong, nothing's disabled. It's just the way that it is. So anyway, I hope that helps. It's a long answer, but it, it, there's a mindset behind the question. I hope, I hope that this listener gets this. There's the specifics that are being assumed in the numbers uh, that matters. And then there's also that kind of God-given design to go back to and say, look, what, what is a family? And all three of those angles are just essential to getting to the heart of this question. And 